I am so excited Scott to have you here we have had many of these interviews but you really bring out a whole special level of what happens from the balance of being a musician and the balance of being an entrepreneur oh, thank this you well first of all I'm is... really happy to be here because you know we're gonna talk about my favorite subject so I'm, 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 this is awesome I love it because I love artists we've got to help them figure out because this is like I said the greatest time in history for them and they just need to figure out how to maneuver the new landscape. It really is, and this is yeah. what the sessions is about. We've done many of these interviews, we've done many of these panels that we have at universities, and what's right. amazing about it is that this next level of musicians that are coming up, they have an opportunity in front of them that is oh. so exciting. No, it's crazy. Sometimes they don't understand that. So sure. let's just start from the musical side. Where did it start playing music for you in the early days? Um, I actually grew up in a musical family. My father's a musician, and um, he grew up, and he was on a show called The Lawrence Welk Show. Oh, is that magic? So I grew up on Lawrence Welk, How and so great. I'm actually the one person on the planet that can say I actually played with Lawrence Welk and Pink Floyd. <laughs> right? Now, that's a, that's a different one, right? <laughs> that is absolutely different. <laughs> yep, so I grew up in that, and my dad, which is interesting because uh, he was a serial entrepreneur mm. on top of it, so that's why I got in, sort of involved in the entrepreneurship. Very interesting. We yeah. had multiple businesses. We had boat businesses, donut businesses. We had lighting businesses. We had reed businesses. And my dad was one of the first guys, that, well, actually one of the, the guys that helped basically invent the Wawa pedal. How, which is interesting. How is that? What yeah. instrument did he play you then? My dad plays uh, all the woodwinds, you know, saxophone, clarinet. He played 14 instruments, everything from oboe, English horn, to clarinet, saxophone, Great. flutes. He was NBC staff and did a lot of that yeah. kind of stuff. And so. the Lawrence Welk Band had fantastic musicians oh, in that yeah. band. These guys were oh, serious yeah. players. Oh, yeah, big time. So you started playing? And, and, young and age. I was a trumpet player first. Okay, trumpet first. Yeah, okay. I played trumpet through the years, uh, which is interesting because my dad, being a woodwind player, yeah, um, I took up trumpet. I don't know why. I, he was he did a did a thing called Music Man Take Ten, which was a which was a document not was a new show that they were doing back, and it was one of the very first shows that they did um, for videotape, believe it or not. And they had all the instruments showed up at the house. I picked up the trumpet, and said, "I'm going to be a trumpet player." And so that's where I was all the way through college. And How switched cool to saxophone is that? After that? Did you take lessons on sax at a certain point to get you into it? Was it something that you started? To well, focus I started. I mean, I took a lot of lessons, trumpet lessons, through the years, right. and then um, once I, I worked with a guy by the name of um, Stan Worth. And he had a he was doing a club gig, and I came on. And he said, "Hey, will you take up the saxophone?" So I just took up the saxophone to play one song, and <laughs> the rest is sort of history. I got That's into it after great. that. Were there any saxophone players that you started to listen to that you kind of kind of like? Oh yeah, I mean, I have a whole series of guys. I mean, everybody from Fathead Newman to Lockjaw Davis, Ben Webster, Ike Quebec, and my all-time favorite is Junior Walker. How great! It's Junior Walker and How the All Stars. My great. favorite of all. So time. you really stepped into the music scene. So then, mm -hmm. how did your career grow musically to go on to? Becoming to play with the greats of Pink Floyd and Toto and my gosh, you've got so much that you've done. How'd that lead you to the, all the performances part of your career? What I try to tell, I, even, I tell all artists, you know, I would take any gig I could possibly take, any club gig, Excellent. wherever it was, and I would always adjust to where the people were. So if even if a free gig came up, I'd go play that gig if, if it was if it was the right crowd, right. as opposed to taking the paying gig that wouldn't put me in front of the right people. And I've always tried to take it. You know, Look at you know the opportunity of when you're in front of people to try to figure out who they are, what they know, what right. they do, and it's right. amazing. I've met some incredible people that actually really changed my career playing in clubs, and I had no idea. It's like Supertramp, right. for instance. I was playing a club gig every Sunday and Monday, and there was a guy that used to sit in the back of the room, and I didn't realize it until I finally went up to him and I started talking to him, and it was the uh, the drummer in Supertramp. So I became <laughs> friends with him, and yeah. then when the, the the opening came up, I got the call, and you know. So you always want to make sure you're really understanding who the audience is from a deeper level than just, you know, fan. I try, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that, that led you to where? After Stupid Tramp, you know, how, how'd you get involved with Pink Floyd? Well, well it's actually interesting. Actually, I, it was actually, really, Seals and Croft was the first kind of major band I played with. Nice. And I toured with them and then went on to uh, uh, a variety of other bands and stuff. And I conducted for David Soul. I don't remember him sure. years ago. Absolutely. Did his thing. And then um, I got... The, called for to do the Super Tramp gig, and then actually Dave Gilmore came and played on a Super Tramp album when we were working on it, and that's how I met Dave. And that night I invited him to a club gig. I have a band called the Hang Dynasty with Leland <laughs> Lee Scalar plays oh, in that band, and you know, and there was a whole bunch of us, and we played at this uh, bar, and Dave came in, and uh, next thing you know, he called me to go play on the album, and a couple days later, I after I went and played on the record, he called me up, and said, "Hey, we're going out, in the new band. You want to be in the band?" I said, "Sure, let's go." So. Actually, I turned it down at first, uh, mainly because I didn't know much about Pink Floyd. I was a real kind of R&B guy, right? So I didn't really understand. So I actually told Dave, I said, Dave, let me let me get back to you, 
in a couple of days. And I told a few friends of mine, they said, what are you crazy? You got to do it. And I remember going that night to um, Tower Records and buying Pink Floyd records and oh, came back and dad, listened to them. So that was the first, that dope. was really the thing. And then I called Dave and I said, yeah, let's go. And I'm in. boy, am I thank, thankful I did that. That was a smart move. That would have been really dumb to turn that one down. <laughs> well, there's so many good musicians. I mean, even yeah. Toto. How, how oh, you yeah. Toto. Well, it's interesting. When I was in high school, the first band I was in was called Merciful Soul Band. And I was the oldest guy at 17 years old. And the band was Jeff Beccaro and David Page. Right. So I grew up with those guys. Jeff was one of my all-time best friends. I and met Jeff my, in 76. My guru. What a prince. My guru. What a I mean, prince of a guy. Prince of a guy. One of the great drummers of all time. Yeah. And I've learned more from him. And it's actually interesting. He was... I was... A trumpet player, and I played in the band. It was like a, you know, a, what, like a Tower of Power, not a Tower of Power, but a Blood, Sweat, and Tears, right. you know, Chicago kind of nice, band with nice. Dave and all those guys. And I was the worst guy in the band. <laughs> There's no doubt. I was the worst guy. I was lucky that I could play the second trumpet parts. I'm sure you have because of humility. Is yeah, there. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. And, uh, you know, Jeff and those guys started to take off. Jeff took off. And so I was always, man, I got to practice. And so Jeff was my inspiration. And when I got the call to go play with Toto after playing with their kids, that was a big deal. And funny story, people ask me, what was the best thing about playing with Toto? And you'll appreciate this being right. He says, I got to play Cowbell on four songs with Jeff <laughs> Beccaro. Right? <laughs> Nothing better than that. Absolutely, Oh, my man. God. How was, great. Go to groove school every night, man. Absolutely. So it was, it was you know, great. Jeff is, was, was a, a person that was so musically gifted and oh. talented and whatever he did. And he was really, but he also would recommend other drummers for gigs, too, if he felt oh, yeah. he, he, his sound wasn't right. Powerful guy. So yeah. here you are now. You've developed this incredible musical career mm -hmm. that you have. The entrepreneurial part that you said about with your, with your, your dad, all the businesses they were in. Mm -hmm. Just go back now to the entrepreneurial part and yeah. tell me about your dad with the wah-wah pedal. What, what, okay, what so, so just kind of thinking about the entrepreneur. When I was about 11 years old or 12 years old, people would ask me, what are you going to do in your life? What is it? You know, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to be a musician. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, study business and start being a businessman and start a business. And then third, I was going to do documentary. So I've been kind of following that through the years. How great. Um, but my dad, um, growing up, uh, he started actually the first amplified instruments. He actually took a hearing aid, turned it around and made a microphone for it and actually started. Went to Thomas Organ Company, sold them on the idea. Mm. The whole thing was uh, about turning band instruments into like guitars. Right, you know, like the rock and roll thing, so to make them rock and roll. So he started with the full amplified thing. And Brad Plunkett, who is actually at this show, is actually getting the award 50 years. The Wawa pedal is 50 years this year. It's for the invention of it. And my dad worked directly with him. And if you remember, the name of it was the original Wawa was called the Clyde McCoy Wawa oh, pedal. Is that and amazing. Clyde McCoy was a trumpet player. Absolutely. And he's wop, 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 wop. And that was my dad and him. They worked on all that. My dad did the very first recordings with the Wawa pedal. And I don't know if you remember Sound City, the sure. studio. Well, that was my dad's studio. It was originally called the Vox Sound oh, Lab. Oh, that is amazing. And I remember coming home from school and my dad said, hey, we want to go look at this building. So I went to Sound which was now Sound City. It was four <laughs> walls. And we said, okay, we're going to build a studio here. So, And at the time, he was working with Vox and the Thomas Organ Company, and they needed a place to develop the amplified instruments. So three days later, we took over that building. My dad built Sound City, and I was there, and I grew up throughout the whole Sound City. And it's actually interesting, because there's a movie out on that, you know, that Dave Grohl did, a big documentary. Absolutely, yeah. And he got a little bit of it wrong. Oh, my <laughs> Sorry, <goodness>. Dave. Yeah. <laughs> because okay. I was there in the early days. They talk about it being a warehouse, and it's not true. It was an actual studio, and I used to mm. set up chairs for James Brown coming in there and singing and stuff. And so... Yeah, I grew up in that oh whole God. that whole area. So anyway, they he developed that there and did the first well, recordings. What a magical time. This is oh, yeah. really music history. Oh yeah. So the entrepreneurial part, so your dad did many things. So how did you get involved into well, your you've got so many things that you're doing? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's like when I was out with Pink Floyd, it was in I figured I'm gonna go out for two years and I was I figured out how am I gonna take advantage of it? So I basically read business books the entire time. And actually it was funny, Dave Gilmore and say, hey, what, what are you doing? I said, Dave, I'm going to have me a business. He'd kind of laugh, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but I did. And, you know, in between the tour, I started a company, an audio video post-production company. And we did, uh, you know, work with a company called The Company. And we did all, a lot of music videos, everything from the Rolling Stones, Janet Jackson, you know, a um, whole variety of folks. And, right. and then later I really got involved in this whole technology side of things and saw my future in CD-ROM. Right. And uh, kind of my 
what I'm most proud of as sort of a claim to fame of everything I've ever done is um, there's a book called The 50 Pioneers of Multimedia, and I'm in that book because I, I created the first interactive cartoon. So Powerful. Yeah. Now, how'd you come about that? It was interesting. I was out, um, uh, actually Jeff Baxter from the mm -hmm. Doobies and myself, yeah. I did a project for a company called ProSonus where we developed, I started seeing computers and I was brought in to develop a, an audio pro set of audio tracks for computer users, mm. right? So that they would have tracks that they could put on their thing. And it was called sound bites. <clears throat> Uh, so that really started making me see what CD-ROM was, and then I started hanging out in the cyber scene where I was going to all these cyberpunk guys, right. writing codes in garages and stuff, and yeah. hanging out with Timothy Leary and yeah, all that stuff back in the day. So yeah. I was early on in that, and I saw my future. I was actually sitting at Comdex. We, uh, I produced this ProSonus thing with and Jeff Baxter. We were playing in the booth. And I looked across the room and I saw this thing. I said, what is that? It was a monitor screen. I walked up of it and it was, a, um, it was a children's title called Just Grandma and Me. Hmm. And it was one of the first times that you could click on an object and it would do something. Oh, interesting. And I saw that and I said, man, that's my future. Yeah. So I dove wholeheartedly into the technology space. And that's really where I've spent my time is really focused in tech. Uh, and kind of what's going on and where the market's going and uh, you know built a lot of technology through the years and launched Ouch. a half a dozen companies. So what, what, what's the Ignited Network? Ah, this is the one I'm excited yeah. about. Well, as we know, there's a massive problem. The problem we're solving at Ignite is how does a content creator make money in a world where the content's virtually free? Right. Right? I mean, music today, you can't, you can't sell music. Absolutely. You know, and you, you got to have hundreds of millions of streams to be able to really make any money. You get yeah. a few million people listen to it, it's, it's not enough money to do anything, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So the who model is shifted. And um, so I realized that it was going to take somebody that understood technology yeah. and understood what it was like to be an artist to help figure out and solve that problem. So I spent about a year just really focusing on trying to do a bunch of research to see how to solve that problem and being a technologist and stuff. And so we've launched, I launched Ignited Artist first, which is my accelerator where I would take artists in for a six week program and go through a whole process I call space, which was story, plan, army, conversion, and education. And I'd go through why the story and why they not, why an artist, you're not an artist on a mission. You have to flip that to be a mission and be as, and I happen to be an artist that supports that mission because in order to create a commercial movement, which you're trying to do around right. an artist, you have to create a rally cry. Absolutely. So you have to have something people care about, right. right? And so your story is so important and the story has more things to it because it also gives me data points because now I have access to data. So I can run data scripts to find my audience now. And if I have my story, it helps me figure out who cares about that story. Absolutely. I can find my audience. I can put my products in front of that audience because we're more conversion. So anyway, story plan. I'm a big lean startup guy. So I've taken lean startup principles, which is a whole thing used in Silicon Valley and yeah. how we start companies. And I've applied that now to artists. And then the army is obviously the core people that are most important to you that can really help to spread the word. So yeah. you want to build your your army, and there's Absolutely. a whole strategy for that. And then the big one is the C, the conversion. This is where all artists, and I see them fall down, 99%, 99.9% yeah. of them, yeah. is they can make stuff, but how do I convert it into money? Right, right, right. Right, so how do I convert those dollars? So I focus 100%, everything I do is focused on conversion. And so how do we teach how to conversion strategies and all that? And then the E is the most important one, which is called education. So Mr. <laughs> Artist, if you want to get this game figured out, right. you got to get educated. And right. the beautiful part is this. We have access to Google. Right. Everything you need right now, Artist, is at your fingertips. Learn how to ask that thing questions and you will learn a lot. So education is right there at your fingertips. You can figure it out now. So anyway. Very interesting. So with this here, so are you teaching this where and how and when? Well, okay, I forgot I was going to say, so what is Ignited uh, Network? Yeah. So part of the th strategy was building this educational program, but also building a platform that would serve it. So what we've done, Ignited Networks, we're now launching Ignited Live. And Ignited Live is really a, kind of a broadcast 3.0 mobile network with audience targeting and management built in. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is if you think about social media today, we're, people are putting all this social media, but you can't charge on those accounts. Right. How do you make any money? How, many, how much money you made off those likes lately, right. right? And then the reality is the money is in the super fan. We now know that the super fan represents 68% of your revenue. Wow. So 
And that's 5% of your audience. Absolutely. So that 5% yeah. will generate the most amount of money. The second thing we're trying to solve with it is how do I find these super fans? Right. Well, now we have targeting algorithms using data science and behavioral stuff. Right. So our platform is a mobile network where you can engage your fan base, manage it's all real time because we're moving into a real time world. Right. I don't know if most people realize we're going from public to private right now. Yeah. Everything's moving from social networks are on the downside mm -hmm. and mobile messaging is moving up. By the end of this next year, mobile messaging will have more traffic and more people on them than the social networks. So it's overtaking it. So we're moving into a new world of, of what we call the conversation economy, right. where pieces of media in real time now become conversations. Right. So the network we've built really is about, it's a mobile network where you can upload pictures, video, live streaming, you know, all the types of things that you can do, uh, but it also has a targeting element. So when you hook up all your social networks to it, we go out and find your audience and we serve up the people you need to talk to right, the most because they're the ones. Right. And then they go through a conversion funnel, but you have to pay. Right. Remember? Because otherwise it's a hobby. Absolutely. If I'm not making any money, it's a hobby. Absolutely. One thing I tell artists, fans are nice, but customers are what you're doing. So start right. thinking of them as customers, right. which is really critical because otherwise, like I said, it's a hobby. And my whole model is based on the thousand true fans. A true fan is somebody that will spend $100 a year on you. If I have 1,000 of those fans, there's my first $100,000 in revenue, right? right? So the, our model is go small, build a repeatable model, right. and then scale. So you can, and so what's nice is if you think about it, 2,000 people, not that hard. Absolutely. I just got to create value for them. I got to create something for them. And for artists and musicians today, you are a media network. Every business, everybody is in the media business now. Absolutely. So you have to start thinking totally different about your career. It's about the value you bring because like I said, the money is not in the in so much anymore in the, the selling of music and stuff. Right. The money is in the relationship. Right. It's a relationship. So Ignited Network is a relationship product that allows you to basically have a real relationship with your fans because we know the number one thing a super fan wants is a direct, authentic relationship with right. the artist. Absolutely. So we built that platform. So we're very excited. Our mobile network is getting ready. We just submitted our app to the App Store, and uh, we're hopefully we're going to be launching here pretty soon. That is very exciting. So how is you know, a musician that's watching this, how can they track you down to get information as far as being a part of this? Um, go to ignited.live ignited.live and that'll take them to a page and they can sign up uh, if they're interested in being part of our network. Uh, we're a little different than just anybody signing up because we're really looking for entrepreneurs, right. people that are really serious about being in the business. Because I mean, some people just want to do it for the art form and they want to Absolutely. roll the dice and pray for that hit. And if it happens, it happens. Happens, that's great yeah, and there's right. nothing wrong with that. Right. Our, mar our belief is, is you can make it happen now with a little bit of knowledge and a little understanding and learning how to engage and build an engaged audience base and just think using a lot of these lean startup principles and thinking about how you do things right. uh, there's a real business for you and again 1000 people if you're most artists if you're making 100 grand you're going to be pretty happy right now to start Abs growing your business right absolutely so it's absolutely. and that's very doable so where have you seen that as the music business has changed dramatically mm -hmm. and as it will continue to change you know it, it's not like it's changed and now we're here it's in a oh, no. change process. Game's over. Yeah, it really is. The major labels will probably be gone in a few years yeah. for the most part. Um, it's because nobody cares about... They, their whole bit main thing was distribution before. Right. Yeah. I, I don't, don't need... Either. I have distribution. Yeah. It's free. You know, I've got tools. I can make stuff all day long. It costs me nothing. Yeah. And more importantly, I have access to the audience. And don't forget, on that darn cell phone, yeah. I can take the order. Absolutely. Never could do that before. Absolutely. That's what, no matter that's, where you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's why when I hear artists talk about, oh, it's terrible now, everybody's stealing my stuff and all of that. And I'm like, hey, please steal my music. Please steal my media. Yeah. You know, yeah. I did, we did that with Monty Python. We created, I did out Python line. One of the most, the first things I did is I talked to him and I said, let's give it away. So we had please steal my media tab and we gave it away. <laughs> but the great. whole idea was building engagement and right. then figuring out how we monetize that in other, in other ways. Right. Yeah. So this entrepreneurial, you had mentioned you read many books about it. Sure. You know, it, it, how does somebody who's watching this step into that world of being a more serious entrepreneur? First of all, you've got to make a commitment to get up every day and, do, and educate yourself. Right. So I recommend that 
there's so many great people to follow and a lot of them are not in the music business. Right. I say, don't follow the people in the music business. Right. They're the ones that are the clueless ones. Absolutely. You need to follow the online marketers. Right. You need to go to places and there's some great things, great resources out there uh, that you can go to. There's a company called HubSpot and HubSpot builds a, uh, a platform for businesses, but they have a tab in there that's called the Academy. Mm. You go in there and there's a hundred plus free eBooks on how to use Twitter for business, not yeah. Twitter for fun, <laughs> but Twitter for business, or how to use Facebook ads, how do you do all that stuff? There's so much resource, so that's a great thing. Uh, there's a handful, Copyblogger. Copyblogger.com is one of my favorite all time things. What they do is they teach you the art of how to write copy that converts. Absolutely. Right? Remember, when you're talking to people, you've got to create value. You have to understand what it is, kind of the behavioral pieces to help them do things. Yeah. Because here's a tip for everybody out there. Number one, people do not buy products. Behaviors buy products. Right. When you understand behaviors, you can then start to really make things, move things along. So, right, right. and that's what we have now. We have access to all this data, which is a big deal. So for entrepreneurs or young entrepreneurs, you want to start educating yourself, you know, how to use those tools for business. Um, there's so many people who follow. Another one is growthhackers.com. Mm. Growth hacking is a whole new methodology on how to find audience and, and use technology to Figure it out. Airbnb launched on growth hacking Craigslist. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So you want to make sure that you're up to speed on the new techniques and how to make things happen. Third thing is don't try to do all the platforms. Everybody's like, oh, they're trying to do me. You're better off focusing on one platform, maybe two, yeah. but just being really good at and creating engagement. Right. 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 So to create engagement really mm -hmm. is what this is all about. Yeah, it's all about engagement because people can have, I go on Twitter and I say, oh, wow, look, they got, you know, half a million followers. And then if you look how many people engaged and comment, there's nothing. Absolutely. So it's really interesting because in Twitter, Twitter is all about the DM, the direct message. Right. All the juice happens in the back end, which you don't even see on the front end. Right. So that's where the thing is. But it's all about building engagement and finding out those people. And, you know, there's a lot of techniques to be able to do that. Interesting. Where do you see the business in the change. Where do you see it in two, five, and ten years? Wow, you know, that's a that's a tough, a tough one, one because yeah. you know one of the biggest things that's coming in now is AI, right? And that's coming on like gangbusters, and I don't think most people are ready for it. Uh, it's actually fascinating because this is it has such impact on the entire planet in so many ways. Right. Not only musicians, but everything. I don't know if there's a song called Daddy's Car, go look it up completely designed, built by AI, hmm. and it sounds like the Beatles meets, uh, you know, Alan Parsons or some kind wow. of thing, and it's wow. totally, it's generated by a bot, yeah. which is kind of interesting. So the question is, is where do artists play in this game? And so, again, get up to speed. Don't be afraid of these things. Don't say, oh, they're horrible. You have no choice. You right. have to get in the game. And you got to start focusing on these things and start learning and learning how algorithms work and all right. that kind of stuff, which is a lot different because many artists have a real problem with wanting to, I just want to be, do my art, yeah. you know, man, <laughs> I just want to sit around and smoke a fatty and yeah, play yeah. my guitar, that's right? right? That's and write right. a song. Right. And that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the, the real opportunity is because there's so much confusion right now. Right. That's where the opportunities lie. Right. But it really takes, I get up every day and I start studying. So I, like I said, I tell artists, spend two hours every morning, you're reading blog posts, you're following specific people and you're educating yourself constantly right. Right. on what the right strategies and stuff are. Boy, that's powerful. So in, in the craziness of the music industry, yeah. these young kids that watch us, and we go to many, many universities, mm -hmm. and the questions that come up from these kids are, are just endless because they're sure. excited about the music industry, but they're really confused about the music yeah. industry. So it's interesting. So in closing, what would you say to young musicians that are out there? How, how, would, you, how would you guide them that as they watch this in years to come, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the advice that you're giving is timeless. What can you say to them? First, this is the greatest time in history for you, the independent artist. Because it is the power that you have is the thing that's the door opener. People love to be around artists and create music. I mean, it's, it's, your, special, it's your special power, yeah, yeah, right? And yeah. that special power opens doors, right? Absolutely. So really understanding it, and most importantly, start getting educated in who's making things happen. Start looking at the content marketing people, mm. the guys that are making it happen online, that are learning these conversion strategies, learning how to find and target audience. 
it's really about getting educated and being unafraid of what's going on, but really immersing yourself in it. Second thing is learn how to network. Yeah, absolutely. The whole game and everything is based upon relationships. Learn how to find and target relationships. I try to tell everybody, Twitter, that's a 24-hour cocktail party. Absolutely. And the beautiful part is, I don't have to be invited. I can just go stalk you. I call it a stalking <laughs> network, right? I could go say, wow, I could find you. I could go do research on you on Google, find yeah. out all about you, what you care about, everything that's yeah. going on, right? Yeah. And say, wow, what he represents is something that's important to me. I can then go follow you. I can start commenting. Next thing you know, I'm communicating with you, and now we're becoming pals. Now the relationship is there. Like what I was telling everybody when I go into, I taught at USC this last year, I said, everybody, the day you walk out of class, when you finish this thing, you should be walking in, you know, it's Friday, take the weekend off, I just finished college, Monday you start your job. Right. Don't start looking. You've got two years right now to build those relationships, find where you're at because you have that freaking phone in yeah, your exactly pocket. Exactly right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. really about, um, I think the greatest advice is just really try to get educated. Stay on top of trends. Start looking for those types of trends and look into the guys that are killing it online, mm. making a ton of money. There's one guy... Uh, named Pat Flynn, he posts his money. You know, it's like $80,000 this month. You know, there's insane amounts of money that they're making. Because remember, it doesn't take that many yeah. to really make it happen. So to generate that just kind of money, be yeah. excited about it. And the other part is, I know it's tough because it's a balance between art and business. Yeah. This is the big one. When you're creating content, creating your marketing at the same time is all a piece of the art. Right. The business is an art form too. Absolutely. Make them work together so that you're not trying to say, hey, I don't want to do the business side, I only want to do the art side. Right. Figure out how they become one. Absolutely. Because that's really what it's all about. Absolutely. You know, it's funny, I get inspired when I'm doing certain business projects and writing mm -hmm. books and, and, and publishing them. Equally as to I get excited playing music. And I, I always said, boy, I, I, I kind of like that balance. So they have to welcome that that combination more often. Yeah, and one of the things, I wanted to say one last thing. There's a thing called the seven levels of conversion and conversation. Mm -hmm. And this is one that artists really fall down and they really have an incredible opportunity. What it is is, the number seven, the worst place is advertising. Mm. If you're gonna advertise, that's gonna get like .00 something sick. The next uh, is a, a, a direct mail piece or some kind of piece. That's a little better. Third is social media. Social media is really a connection, but it's not a conversion. I mean, you've got to move them to some place to occur. Right. The next thing, the best thing is a, uh, a phone call, mm. right? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Is a, I take that back, number four and number five is a handwritten note. Right. So I tell artists, if you have a fan that comes on and do something, mm. get out something, write a handwritten note, okay. take a photograph of that and post it. Because people, that shows that you've reached out to them yeah, at absolutely. a different level. So remember, it's about relationship. It's a great line. Number three is a phone call because that's where I can at least get to talk to you. Uh -huh. Number two is a, is a live event. And number one is one-on-one. -on -one. Artist. The best place to convert a fan on the entire planet <laughs> is at your gigs. <laughs> so how are you converting yeah. those people? How are you finding them? What right. offering them? How are you getting their phone numbers? How are you getting their information? Right. Because that list, the money's in that list. So you've got to have a conversion strategy from your live gigs. It's an incredible place. It's, it's, I see squandered all the time. Interesting. Right? Interesting. So well, lost go. opportunity. Scott, it is absolutely magic. What you have done is you've empowered these people to kind of find out where that first step is now to turn this into a career, yep. to turn this ability into a live action, making money, doing what I love doing. That is powerful. Scott, I thank you so much on behalf oh, of the Oh, thank sessions. you very, very You've much. You've done excellent. I love this. <laughs> Anytime, buddy. Anytime absolutely. you want we'll me do on it here. Again. I love you guys. Let's go make some money. <laughs> thank you so much, Scott. Beautiful. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.